How many people have had problems with Japanese beetles? Japanese beetles are, are really bad. Do you know the life cycle of Japanese beetles? Two years. Well, but how does it how does it go? Uh, they lay their eggs in the soil. Lay the eggs in the soil. So you see the adults a lot of times on roses. They will get on fruit trees. They'll get on vegetable crops. The thing about it, and it goes back to like that worm. If you can go through there and pick them off, you know, and have your little soapy water cup or something like that, and you can put them in there or do whatever with them. You know, that's a good way to control them. But just like Nathan said, what you want to look at is that's the adults. The adults will lay eggs in the ground. Those eggs will hatch into grubs. They overwinter as grubs in the ground and come out as adults the next year. So, if you can go in there and apply, there's a couple different products that you can control it in the grub stage before it ever comes out as an adult to come back out. Now there's several uh, granulars that are available to, to put in the ground to control the grubs. But Japanese beetles, because they're so proficient, they have come up with a thing called milky spore. And it's the same kind of like BT. It's not an insecticide. It's a disease that will affect, but it only affects Japanese beetles. So if you've got an area, say under a plant that they've been really bad on, roses, Rose of Sharon, fruit trees, or if you've got a security light that stays on a lot, that's a, you know, they, they're like us. They, they're there, they, you know, they're not gonna run hide somewhere and lay eggs over there. They're just gonna drop down and lay them in there. So if you've got some areas like that, or you've got some turf that's looking a little thin, that might be some areas you want to concentrate this, these granules on to try to control that. And like I said, milky spore is a, I don't know if you want to use the term organic, but it's a non-insecticidal method of controlling. So like I said, with Japanese beetles, you can hit them in the fall to try to control them before they complete the life cycle. And then in the uh, summertime, picking off the adults or spraying carbaryl works with them real good. Now, let me ask you a question about beetle traps. How many have seen Japanese beetle traps? Are they good or bad? They sure do attract them. That's, that's exactly right. They brought them all into my yard. That, that's, that's exactly what, I mean, you know, it has a pheromone in it, but it's got that scent and they're looking for that, so they go straight to it. It's good to use as an indicator so that when they, you start getting them, you can say, okay, now I need to start looking to control them, either you know, using a spray or picking them off or whatever. Or if you've got a big enough place, if you can put that trap way away from the garden, it may pull them your there. Your yeah, your and I've seen people that, you know, they say I get bags and bags and bags of them, and the trouble is they're, they're bringing them from everywhere else. So if you've got a big enough place where you can kind of put it away from the garden, where they'll go there, it's, it's good for that kind of control. But you don't want to put it right at the garden because, like you said, they may come there and get sidetracked to the plant before they get in that trap. They are effective, but you have to be careful about that. All right, now, talking about diseases, one of the things that you can do, and, and we talked about this a little bit last week, crop rotation. There are so many of our plants that have diseases that are soil born. And sometimes it, people kind of like, well, it did, how does it get on the leaves even though it was in the ground? And it's either taken up by the roots or sometimes when it rains, it can splash up on the leaves. So, you know, you want to be careful. Tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, potatoes. You don't want to follow, say, peppers with tomatoes because they're in the same family. You, you've got to go to a different family. And all this is talking about is just the different groups. With your vine crops, some of them call them, you know, melons or cucurbits. And then you got uh, the legumes. But you want to move around. And one of the good crops to rotate with is corn. So if you've got, 
if you're going to grow corn and you've had tomatoes in a spot, that's a good thing. And usually you need to rotate it at least two, if not three years, if you got enough room. I know sometimes space is limited to try to move around. And just like we were talking before we got started, keeping that map and having that so that you can remember, okay, last year I had this here, moving it, moving it around. Diseases are sometimes hard to diagnose. And there's times where it may be a disease and it could be some kind of physical damage. But you've got some areas here that, and I've even, we've even had some diseases that uh, the, uh, it'll go through the leaf and uh, almost looked like a bug had chewed it. But it was a disease and it fell out. That spot fell out. So getting good identification, whether you can find a, a picture or a source uh, or you want to bring it by the office. The thing to remember about diseases and uh, is that with us, if we get sick, we go get something, knock it out, take care of it. With plants, you have to have it as a protection. You have to get it on there to prevent the disease from ever getting started. So it's not like, you know, like I said, we can take something and knock out most of the time whatever, you know, but with plants it has to be a protected. So you have to get, get it protected from the very beginning. And uh, this is what I was talking about a while ago, where you get something, I mean, you know, you can, you can get real fancy when it comes to sprayers. I've seen some, I don't think this one has, some of them may even have a little electric pump on the top that you pull around. I've seen some, you know, you have those, some you put on your back and have a nice uh, handle to pump up the pressure. The important thing is to keep it clean, keep it in good working order, and keep it laid. You know, be sure and, and especially with something like a herbicide like Roundup or something like that, you may be better off to go ahead and have two and keep that separate. Now, you can, you can clean out a sprayer with ammonia, put like a cup of ammonia in these, and it's very good for cleaning out if you, if you don't want to have two sprayers or whatever. But having it marked is very important. And not just, and, and Roundup, like I said, that was one, uh, 2,4-D is something that's used in the yard a lot. And it is deadly on tomatoes. And if you don't get it real clean, there can sometimes be enough trace in it that can really hurt tomatoes. So whether you, you know, whether you mark on it, paint on it, or whatever, you, you really need to be careful with that. Uh, you hear a lot of times talking about what we call a trap crop, but it's marigolds right here. There are other trap crops out there that will sometimes either bugs will go there or there will be enough uh, coming off of plants that will keep critters away. But marigolds is, is the most common. Hmm. Now, something to keep in mind, and I know last week we had the picture of the tree where it was hurting the garden. Uh, you need to be careful about planting under a black walnut tree. There are some, the black walnut gives off what's called jugalone. And tomatoes and azaleas will not grow well under a black walnut. So if you've got a black walnut, there's several other crops that won't, but, but it's just something about what those roots give off. We're talking about planting warm season, and we'll get into that in just a minute. We just wanted to put, just throw a few cool season crops so that you can can have some stuff in the fall and and go through the winter and uh, you know you hear a lot of people talk about your greens where you got your mustard and lettuce and uh, cabbage and then beets grow fairly fast so you could get a crop in pretty quick and 
one thing to keep in mind that uh, chart that was in that uh, handout last week is it's got usually your days to harvest so for instance pumpkins if you want to plant pumpkins and have them harvested around the middle of October going back it's like 90 days I think it is for the pumpkins backing up to plant so that they'll be there and it's the same sort of thing with beets or some of these quicker ones that are gonna you know in turnips you can get them in quicker you know before they get too cold. If you're the only one in the family that likes turnips there ain't no need in planting a big patch of turnips so why grow something that the family's not going to eat? Once you have picked all your tomatoes and you're through with them pull those plants up, carry them to the compost pile or whatever just sometimes you can if you get them in and till them in good they'll they'll rot but I just like tomatoes and things like that just get them out of the garden put them in the compost pile they'll go through a heat that'll kill any spores or whatever but don't just leave them in the garden to, to cause problems for the next year. Who would have imagined how popular asparagus has gotten? My mama and no my daddy and my sister were the only ones that would eat it growing up I finally, they find a way to cook it where I can enjoy it now. But, I mean, the Asparagus Federation or whoever has done a heck of a job marketing now. You know, but I do get a lot of questions about asparagus. And it's one that it takes some patience to grow yeah. asparagus. You get and kind of steam it, you know, it's not. So okra, I mean, uh, asparagus is about that way. But with asparagus, if you want to plant asparagus, and it will grow here. We've got a lot of people to grow asparagus it's one of those that you gonna have to go ahead and find an area that you're going to devote just to asparagus because it's a perennial crop you plant it one year you don't harvest it the next year you can plant it you can cut it for a couple of weeks and then you don't want to cut it over four weeks even after it's fully mature because it would take too much from the plant but you can see these spears coming up and um, coming up out of the crown so if you want asparagus, it's not like we were talking about rotation and stuff like that. That's one of those that you've got to devote some, some space to. Most of the time, you like to use the vegetative parts, though. Buying asparagus plants or, you know, crowns, different terms that is, that's used. They do we get that. a lot of questions about rhubarb. And, uh, you know, it will grow here. It's very similar to asparagus as far as growing for a little while and needing to do that and being careful how much you cut off because you think about these leaves they're making the they're going through the photosynthetic process and, and putting it down into the crown and into the root area to maintain it so you don't want to go in and completely clean it out English peas if you can just see how tall they can get and they are a legume and uh, you know they're a good crop to grow, they're a cool season crop, and they, because they're a legume, we're putting nitrogen back in the soil. Now, one of the things that I enjoy when I get ready to do presentations is, is doing some studying and, and learning, uh, you know, to get prepared for, uh, for a class. <laughs> what, is, what is sweeter, smooth beans or wrinkle beans on English peas? The wrinkle ones are sweet.